What's up everybody? Dr. Rossi, Shrinks at Sneakers.com. I've been covering the most commonly prescribed medications in psychiatric practice in the United States over the last several videos, and I want to cover this medication even though it did not make the list. So this is not one that's included in the most commonly prescribed in the U.S., but it's one that people have a lot of questions about. It's one I've been specifically asked to cover and talk about, and that is Seroquel or Quetiapine. Now, this is a dopamine blocking medication, also known as an antipsychotic medication or second generation antipsychotic medication. So when people hear about quetiapine, they often think, well, I don't have psychosis, I'm taking this for depression, does this make sense? So we're gonna answer that question, we're gonna help you to kinda understand why this medication may be beneficial for people dealing with major depressive disorder or bipolar depression specifically. So quetiapine offers a lot of benefits over other medications. One, it's got a low risk for EPS. Two, it has a broad spectrum of activity, meaning that it works for schizophrenia, it works for bipolar disorder, it works for bipolar depression, and it works for major depressive disorder as an adjunctive treatment. The main limitations, though, that we see, and we are facing several with this medication, is weight gain, sedation, and something called orthostasis. So we'll talk about the side effects in a little bit in the video. Now one of the ways we deal with the sedation is we use what's called an extended release formulation and that formulation is given once at night before the person goes to bed and that helps alleviate some of that sedation although sometimes people complain of it carrying into the next day anyway. Now I've already kind of told you the FDA approved indications for this medication. They are the ones I listed above. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, bipolar depression, and major depressive disorder as an adjunctive treatment. So again, broad spectrum of activity works in a lot of different disorders. Now, the reason it works in these disorders is because of the mechanism of action. Now, some of this is similar to other dopamine blocking medications that we've already talked about, example being orlanzapine. And that is that these are blocking dopamine D2 receptors. That's the main effect. And that's what we think targets the positive symptoms of psychosis, things like delusions, hallucinations, etc. So the positive symptoms of, of psychosis are targeted with that D2 blockade. Now, additionally, there's what's called serotonin 2A receptors, which can enhance dopamine in certain regions of the brain. And we think that this serotonin 2A receptors are responsible for some of the side effects or, or alleviating some of the side effects of these medications, namely the motor side effects that we talked about with EPS, as well as some of the cognitive side effects as well. So the serotonin 2A receptors play a role here. And again, we'll be blocking those receptors with this medication. Now, there's another, there's another serotonin receptor that's being actually stimulated, and that is 5-HT1A. So this is a serotonin receptor 1A that is being partially activated by these medications. And we think that that has something to do with the antidepressant effects of this medication. And I always say in these videos that these medications hit a bunch of different receptors. They just don't do so in as much of a meaningful way as it does with the D2 receptors, right? So it's, a, so it's hitting other receptors. It's just not necessarily in, in the same meaningful way, maybe not as much of an impact. But what's interesting about this medication is there's a couple of other things that are being targeted. So its effects on depression specifically and bipolar depression may be related not only to the 5-HT1A partial agonist activity, but there's also some norepinephrine reuptake blockade, like venlafaxine, let's say. There's some 5-HT2C and 5-HT7 blocking properties as well, which may help with depression. So you can see from the mechanism that there's several receptors that may be beneficial in, in alleviating the depressive symptoms that we see couple of clinical points that are very important is often quetiapine is underdosed and it's stopped prematurely before an adequate trial has been completed. So people don't think it's working, they're not taking enough a uh, high enough dose to see the full effects and so they stop the medication prematurely. This is something we have to be we have to watch out for. Also, high doses are generally producing a greater response specifically in manic phases. Or, psychotic, or, or if they're psychotic symptoms. So specifically, if you have manic symptoms or psychotic symptoms, higher doses generally work a little bit better. Now, how do we dose this medication? Well, it's, different, it's a little different for each disorder. For schizophrenia, you can start with 25 milligrams twice a day. If you're gonna use the extended release formulation, which helps reduce sedation, 
you can use 300 milligrams at night. You can start with 300 milligrams of the XR at night. Now the target dose, like I said, it's kind of high. It's higher than you might expect. It's somewhere between 400 and 800 milligrams for most people. Sometimes we go above that depending on the circumstances, but in most cases we're thinking about 400 to 800 milligrams should be adequate to treat schizophrenia. For bipolar disorder, things change a little bit, slightly. Instead of starting with 25, you're starting with 50 milligrams twice a day or 300 of the XR at night, at bedtime. The target dose is actually the same, 400 to 800 milligrams for mania, and if you're using it as an adjunct for bipolar depression or using it for the bipolar depression component, you're going to actually target a slightly lower dose, and that's going to be 300 milligrams per day for depression. Now, the reason behind this is that they actually did a study where they compared 600 milligrams and 300 milligrams for bipolar depression. And these studies were carried out by Calabrese and Thace, one in 2005 and one in 2006. And what they found was there's no difference between the 300 and 600 milligram dose for depression, for the depressive component of bipolar disorder. So using 300 milligrams, it's a lower dose, it's safer, less side effects. It makes a lot of sense from the data that we go with 300 milligrams instead of 600. For depression, it's a little bit different too, right? We're gonna be going for 50 to 100 milligrams per day in divided doses with a target dose of anywhere from 150 to 300 milligrams per day. Now there's data on this too, where they looked at 150 milligrams versus 300 milligrams for major depressive disorder adjunctive therapy. And what they found was that there really wasn't much difference between the 150 and the 300. So I'm a believer that we go with lower doses if possible and not go right to the highest possible dose unless there's an indication to do so. And in this case, the data kind of tells us, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter 150 or 300. Now, again, that's going to be a clinical judgment. You may determine that maybe someone is getting benefit from the, from the 300 over the 150 and you may go up anyway. But anywhere in that 150 to 300 range would be appropriate for somebody who's getting adjunctive treatment for major depressive disorder with quetiapine. The maximum dose, like I said, is generally FDA approved at 800 milligrams a day. Some patients in certain cases, and this is based on blood levels usually, you'll do blood levels of the, of the medication, which is becoming more popular in psychiatry now, looking at blood levels to follow whether or not the person is uh, getting an adequate dose. We can look at 800 to 1200 milligrams per day and that's specifically in the more severe mental illnesses like psychosis and bipolar disorder. Now monitoring, you want to be mindful of this. There's a, like I said, there's propensity for weight gain and there's also propensity for diabetes. So if someone has a family history of these things, if somebody is already struggling with weight gain, then you want to be mindful. Maybe you want to use a different medication, but at the very least, you should get the person's weight. You should calculate a BMI. You should take a waist circumference. And you should also do a fasting glucose and a fasting lipid profile because the, this medication has been known to increase blood, fasting blood glucose as well as increase lipids, right? So we want to be mindful of those things when we're prescribing this particular medication. And you want to monitor those things on a regular basis. Side effects, we talked about the main ones that cause problems for people, things like sedation and the orthostasis is really a, a form of hypotension, so low blood pressure, cause somebody to feel dizzy. You can also have dry mouth. Some people get constipated on this medication. Some people have weight gain and some people have fatigue throughout the day. So we want to be mindful of these things and watch for side effects. To avoid the hypotension or orthostasis, you want to titrate a little more slowly and you want to avoid major jumps in the medication dose. So that's the one way we, we, tr we treat that. An important point about side effects that this medication doesn't have is it doesn't cause prolactin elevation, which is important because things like Risperdal do cause some prolactin elevation, and there's essentially no motor side effects with this. So it actually might be a better option for somebody who has psychosis in Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, although we have a newer medication that doesn't work on dopamine receptors at all, and that is called pimavanserin. So in a future video, maybe we'll cover pimavanserin if people are interested. Important point about the XR formulation, do not crush it or chew it. You're going to destroy the release mechanism, which is going to probably lead to medication dumping. So we want to avoid crushing or chewing that medication or altering it in any way. You just want to swallow the pill whole the way that it is. If a person's been off this medication for more than a week, then we want to restart as if this is the initial therapy. 
there is also some abuse potential for Seroquel. And specifically, this research has been conducted in incarcerated populations, so a lot of prison systems who do psychiatric care will not carry things like Welbutrin for the abuse potential, and they will not carry things like Seroquel because of the abuse potential. So this has been eliminated from those populations in many cases, not all cases. The initial studies with this medication in beagle dogs, believe it or not, they tested this on dogs, uh, these dogs developed cataracts. And so there was worry and concern that humans would develop cataracts, although no studies have shown this association. It's something to still be mindful of just in case. So with that said, I'm going to cut the video there. If you guys have additional questions or comments, please drop them below. I'm happy to answer them. I'm happy to talk more about this medication. And if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a like and a, and a subscription to the channel here, it can help us to grow and to create more videos that are based on your interests.